Uh, I want to introduce some of the folks that are here tonight. All uh, four of our school board members are here tonight. That includes our chair, Tina Certain, our vice chair, Dr. Leonetta McNeely, board member Kay Abbott, and board member Diane McGraw. We also have our chief of equity, inclusion, and community engagement. That is Dr. Antonique Edwards, she is here. And our deputy superintendent, Donna Jones, is here. We have a couple of documents for you. One is a frequently asked questions that has some of the most commonly asked questions that we've received since this process started a few weeks ago and answers to those questions. We have a more detailed version on our rezoning website, which is sbac.edu slash rezoning. So we encourage you to check that out. We've got even more questions and answers on that page. If you would prefer not to come up to the microphone and share your input tonight, you can also use our QR code to get to our special rezoning email box. The address is rezoning at gm.sbac.edu. So if you'd prefer to email your input, that is absolutely fine. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Certain to make a few remarks. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And as has been said, I want to thank the citizens and everyone who's here. Thank Ms. Mayo and the staff of Norton for setting up and hosting us tonight. And I just have just a few remarks tonight. I want to thank everybody for participating. We've seen um, some citizens have attended one or more of these meetings and we're having them to um, receive feedback from the community about um, comprehensive rezoning. Elytra County Public Schools has been managing our facilities challenges for many years. Aging facilities in need of modernization, a backlog of deferred maintenance, and some of our schools are overcrowded and using portables while others are un underutilized. Um, or under enroll. In 2018, citizens approved the half cent sales tax, which provided much needed funding to address the capital facility needs of our district. And for that, I say thank you. Building and renovations alone will not solve the long standing facilities problems that we're, we're facing. We can't continue to kick the can down the road and avoid rezoning. The board has to update the school attendance lines by rezoning. The last comprehensive rezoning was done around 1983 and a larger spot rezoning was done back in 2002. I understand and acknowledge the stress and anxiety that many may feel when the topic of rezoning comes up, but this really is a necessary step. As stated in policy 5120, rezoning modifications may be appropriate following construction of a new school, construction of additional facilities at an existing school, closing or suspension of operations of an existing school, over or under, uh, over or under capacity school, um, of a school, and the growth or decline of student population. Changes may be justified after consideration by the board of the following things, financial and administrative efficiency, utilization of existing school physical facilities, school capacity and grade level capacity, convenience of access to schools, safe and efficient student transportation and travel, as well as effective and appropriate instructional programs, socioeconomic diversity in school enrollments with consideration of equitable impact on student enrollment at each school. So there's a lot that we have to consider and we're not just taking um, this stance kind of haphazardly, it's just something that it really does need to be done and we ask for your patience, we ask that you trust the process and we really are listening to the community and trying to make the best decision that we can to, develop, to deliver a first class equitable, free, and appropriate public education to every student in Alachua County. And I thank you all for coming tonight, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ms. Certain. Let me uh, give you a quick rundown of how tonight is going to go. We are going to have a brief presentation uh, that includes some statistics, some numbers, enrollment, capacities at our schools. Uh, I want to stress that these are current figures. These are not based on any developed maps or anything because we don't have any new maps. We don't have any new zone, line drawn, zone lines drawn. Uh, we are waiting to get public input before any of that happens. Now, once it does happen, we will have some more community input sessions, and I'll go over that in just a little bit. And then after that presentation, it will be time to hear from you. So anybody who would like to come up and speak, just line up behind the microphone. You see we've got a timer there. Everybody will have three minutes to address the board. And the, the clock will count down. When your time is up, you're, he'll, you're, you'll hear a little beep, and Ms. Certain will call up the next speaker. Uh, I, again, I do want to stress no maps have been drawn. 
I do want to let you know that tonight's meeting, as all of our input sessions have been, it's being recorded, and we will post on that same website so everybody can see what has been said and what has been shared with both the board and with the staff who are going to be working on rezoning. So at this point, I am going to turn things over uh, to Dr. Edwards, who is going to share uh, some preliminary information with you. Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Jackie. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you out here tonight. We know that your time is valuable as well as your voice. That's why we're here. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about why we are rezoning, uh, and then we'll talk about um, why we're not building new spaces. First of all, we haven't rezoned for the last 40 years, not since 1983. Um, we know that changes affecting attendance since uh, will include population growth, new development, migration within the county, school choice options, such as our magnets our charters and our vouchers and we know that um, the way legislation moves around those things also impacts um, how we will make decisions about um, our rezoning. 20 uh, of our schools right now actually are at 90 percent or more capacity and so we know that there is overcrowding in the majority of schools within our district. Um, if you have been at a former meeting then you have heard us talk about there being 5,400 empty seats district-wide, and you'll see that a change has occurred on our slide to um, note that it is 4,800, and so a little bit later on today there will be some more clarity around why that number has changed. Um, also, facilities and operating funds have not been used effectively, and so that means less money for our instructional opportunities and learning and materials, and so we want to make sure that we're devoting our money and our finances to what's important for our students to learn. And there are questions uh, for why we don't just build new buildings instead. And we know that construction is extremely costly. We would literally be spending millions of dollars on any given school that is built. Facility funding is limited and there are limitations by a state statute and legislation and requirements um, that really outline what needs to happen in terms of construction. It puts a strain on our core facilities and then there is becomes a lack of space and infrastructure at some of our schools. We know that we have some schools that are landlocked and we can't build out and so we have to consider what what that means and using our spaces of availability throughout the county um, so that we can disperse and use funds wisely, um, allow for opportunities for all of our students to have the same wonderful learning spaces. As you can see in the pictures to the right of those words on the screen where Westwood is having um, reconstruction right now. And we want for all of our kids to be able to participate um, in really nice facilities for their learning process. So thank you. I turn it over to Ms. Wynn. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm excited that you're all here and look forward to hearing what you have to say. I want to talk about the shift from the 5,400 to the 4,800 uh, available seats district-wide, kind of right out of the gate. And you'll see that the format of our capacity enrollment tables have changed slightly. One thing that happened when I was doing the the work to come up with the division of these tables is I double counted the 600 student stations at Hawthorne. So that was a mistake that I made and I apologize for that, but that accounts for that those extra 600 seats that were in the initial slides. Overall, that won't affect our rezoning process and so I want to assure you of that. Our main goal for the why for rezoning is to create and sustain high quality learning experiences. And the way that I think about that is a student sitting on a three-legged stool and one leg is the place, another leg are the programs and another leg are the people, the people including the staff and the teachers and the community and parents. And so I feel like this rezoning process will address the place and uh, making sure that we provide relief to our overcrowded facilities as much as we possibly can during this process and that we use our facilities and our funds efficiently. 
We've rearranged the order of our slides to be in decreasing order of percent utilization from the highest to the lowest. All of the red represents schools that are at 90% or above utilization, which is the enrollment divided by the school's capacity. The yellow is the 85 to 95% utilization, and anything below 85 is in green. Overall, including our three vacant schools that we have, which is Duval Elementary, Prairie View, and Old Terwilliger campuses, we have 2,522 empty elementary seats. Without the vacant schools, we have 942 vacant seats. In this process, this rezoning process, there are no plans to transition vacant sites back into traditional schools. That's something that, that will be board directed and, and be board decisions. The High Springs population on this chart includes elementary and middle schools. So with our combination schools, instead of trying to break them apart on two different charts and double counting the capacity for Hawthorne like Suzanne did, which I apologize again, We've chosen to put them on one chart for clarity. We have the same information uh, with the detailed enrollment and capacity numbers as well as the percent utilization for middle school as well. We have 1,355 empty middle school seats district-wide. And this chart includes Oakview Middle School, fifth through eighth. So their enrollment reflects grades five through eight. And then the next slide uh, represents our high schools, again in descending order for percent utilization. District-wide, we have 940 empty high school seats district-wide. This chart includes Hawthorne Middle and High School, which are grades 6 through 12. And Lofton is a school of choice for students district-wide, so there are no uh, specific geographic zones attributed to Lofton High School. We're including the center information on these slides. These are schools and centers that serve uh, specialized student populations and they require special services. They're not part of the rezoning process. We will have geographic student zone to these schools. The information that was previously displayed is represented on these maps um, to show a little more clearly that we have the bulk of our over capacity, over utilized schools in the western part of our county. Our district can be categorized into over capacity uh, issues in the western part of our county and old, older schools that are in need of modernization in the eastern part of our county and the city of Gainesville area. This represents our middle school utilization that was on that chart, again in map form, showing that the western part of our county is over enrolled. And then the next slide, we have the high schools. One thing I want to mention when we have over-enrolled schools, one of the challenges with that is we have our core facilities are stressed. So we have situations where our children are starting to eat lunch at 9.30 in the morning. We have undersized media centers. We don't have enough spaces for all of our support staff. Uh, to be in the instances of middle and high schools, we have very crowded hallways during class change times. We have increased traffic that can cause some safety issues, especially for walkers and bikers. You know, so, the, so those are some of the concerns. In addition to spending about currently eight hundred and fifteen thousand dollars on portable leases district wide, so we would like to you know, use our spaces efficiently and redirect those funds towards educating our children and staff and wonderful things like that. So, Questions? absolutely. A year. Would you like her to go to the mic and ask her a question? Could you please come to, your, to the mic so we can get it recorded? 
I'm Sandra. I'm a citizen, and um, I wanted to ask you how much is that? Is that um, how often is that? Is it monthly or yearly or for the portables? Yeah, and I apologize for that uh, lack of clarity. It's eight hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year that we spend on about one hundred and twenty portables that we're leasing. Okay, and that's for all the schools. Yes. These maps represent kind of a snapshot of our student population. The more black that you see basically represents more students are concentrated in those areas. These maps are, are here to show you that we have captured all of our student data in GIS, and that's going to help us with this rezoning process. The other thing that's represented on these maps, if you look at Oakview Middle School, what we've done on these maps is divide the actual enrollment. Instead of attempting to divide the capacities on the previous charts, we've divided the actual counts for fifth graders for Oakview on this map. So for our combination schools, they're kind of captured on, on each of the relevant slides. And then Oakview, the remaining total enrollment is, is captured on this for sixth through eighth graders. We have the same information for our high schools. We coordinate with the Alachua County as well as all of our local cities to capture active development and planned upcoming development that may happen over a period of 20 years. These maps represent active development that we're expecting to happen now through the next three years. And we have projected student generation multipliers that we update every couple of years. We just did that when we went through an impact fee study. When we have a concurrency review, we have single family and multifamily units. For our student generation multipliers currently, we have in, for our single family, for every 100 single family units, that's expected to generate 12 elementary students, six middle school students, and nine high school students. And then for multifamily units, for every 100 units, we're expecting six elementary students to be generated, three middle school students, and three high school students to be generated. So this information is also captured in our database as well, so we can incorporate this information into our rezoning process as well. And it's continually being updated every time I review a concurrency uh, form that's submitted by the city or the, the city, one of the cities or the county. So this information, you'll see the, basically the bubbles will stay in the same spots and it shows, you know, basically with the elementary school zones, the middle school zones and the high school zones where this development is happening. And you can see again, it's concentrated in the western part of our county, the city of Newberry, the city of High Springs is really becoming active now and the city of Alachua. These tables are basically the tables in a bigger form that you've seen on the previous slides. This shows you the total number of students per the current concurrency service areas that we have. This information has already changed with additional concurrency service area reviews that I've received. As we go through this rezoning process, as I've said, this, this data will be live and it will be, be updated so we can have, take that into account. So, are there any questions related to the information that I presented? Yes, sir. Come up to the microphone, please. Several schools were closed, and my question is spe specific to one of them, which is the old Terwilliger. Under the state rules and the funding that you can get from the half mill or half penny tax and stuff, can you make that viable again for, I mean, even if it's, 30, 40 million dollars, and that's all I have. We can redevelop that school, yes. The limitations on us uh, for our funding on the 1.5 mil money, we could use that money to redevelop that school as long as we didn't increase capacity. If we increased capacity, we would have to use our sales tax. And the other source of our capital funding is CO and DS money. That's money that we have to use on our project priority list, and that's typically spent on large HVAC and roof replacement projects each year. Uh, 
I want to give you a quick rundown of our calendar for the comprehensive rezoning process. First, of course, are these community input sessions that we've been having this spring. Uh, this is the fourth out of the five that we'll be having. We have one more scheduled for May 10th at Santa Fe High School. Everyone is welcome to attend that session as well. Plan is for the staff to present to the school board for the first time proposed, and I stress proposed, maps and new zone lines on August 16th. The board will not be voting at that time. That's simply a workshop for the staff to present to the school board and to the community what those proposed maps and zone lines look like. And then the next day we will post them on our rezoning website and then for the next couple of months we will do what we've been doing here but we will actually have maps and zone lines to present to the community and to get the community's input on those maps and zone lines. So that will be happening between August 16th and October 17th with the dates and times and locations to be announced um, a little bit later. There is a process that legally the school board has to go through before changing zone lines, and there is a certain amount of time that the state specifies has to come between each of these steps. The first step is what's called the first reading. That happens on September 19th. Then we have a public hearing on October 17th. And then the second reading and a vote on the proposed maps and zone lines on November 7th. Now, it says October 17th is the public meeting, but that I do want to stress that all of these meetings, all of these school board meetings, workshops, are open to the public, and they all include a time for community input. The plan is for the new attendance zones to take effect in the fall of 2024. In other words, students will be going to their new zone schools for the 24-25 school year. So at this point, we'd like to invite anybody who would like to address the board to come up to the microphone. Again, you'll have three minutes. I will be running the timer, so you'll be able to see how much time you have left to speak. So again, just please feel free to line up at the microphone. And Ms. Johnson, before we start in the, yes. to the audience, I want, just want to let everyone know, we're missing one of our colleagues here, Dr. Rockwell. She's a little bit under the weather, and so she's not with us tonight. She sends her regrets, and she'll watch the video once it's posted, but that's why she's not here. Always be first. <laughs> you give us your name, please. You'll have three minutes. Hi, I'm Heather Manis. I had a couple uh, areas where I think more information would be helpful, um, and particularly once you've, um, I mean, I'm saying this so you can gather information and make your decisions. Um, it's not necessarily like I need this information now, but this is what information I would want you to be considering. <laughs> and so things that I would like to see when you're proposing your plan, how these sorts of things were considered. So. Um, one of them is uh, block scheduling as a potential solution, um, and that could be at some locations. It might not be a district-wide kind of choice. Um, and the other thing is there seems to be a heavy emphasis on moving into a full capacity situation where you're not doing, um, where you're no longer having to rely on leased portables and things like that. And I'm not sure that I quite buy into the urgency of that need. Um, one of the complication factors in many of this, um, you know, considerations for this is that there is a proposal for a Springs County and some changes in what might be different school zones and things like that, that would open up, I would imagine, new state funding lines for new buildings to support all of this growth on the West. And so I'm not sure that it makes sense to do a heavy reinvestment in changes if that is something that might be coming down the line in five years. So is it okay to hold off with some of these portable situations for a little bit longer until we have more definitive answers there? Um, you know, and I was also just thinking about where that money might be uh, reallocated. If we did save it on portables, it wasn't clear how that money gets then respent. If you were able to save that money there, where it would go, where you're currently having issues in your budget and you're looking to recoup money to be able to address certain problems where you're short funded. I know that there's colors of money often where you can spend it in one category but not in another. And I don't have a good sense of what, the, what those are and where the problems are and how shifting this might overall affect that. Um, and then the other thing that I was unclear about is 
non-Alachua County public school zones on the different maps and how that might be incorporated into your decision making. Like PK Young exists and some children go there. And so that provides a, um, a resource to some families and has a geographical location that may impact other decisions for this county. There's a new Santa Fe College High School um, that's been created and how that might be impacting families and situations um, and the geographical inputs of that. Thank you, is it Ms. Menes? Menes, thank you for that. Um, I will let you know that, P I can't answer this one here, PK Young is its own school district, so they're not part of our district, so any decisions we made are independent of what they, um, what they do. But thank you for those who've made note of those questions. Anyone else? And you could please, if you would, queue up, like, go ahead and line up. That would um, help us to be more efficient. Thank you. I'm Katrina Alford. I have a son at Talbot. I had a question regarding uh, uh, how close neighborhoods are to school, whether they'd be, re um, like, so for example, if a neighborhood is two miles from the school, are they still going to be considered for rezoning? Is there a cutoff line um, in terms of distance neighborhood to school? Okay, so that is something that would be considered though, you know, is the distance from neighborhoods to schools when doing the rezoning? That is something that's an option. Okay, and then another question I had is, I noticed that anything that was 90% to 100% is still considered over capacity. If the schools aren't necessarily having any active construction and they're on the lower end of the percent of that 90%, is that something that they're still going to be um, considered for a rezoning or is the higher priority those that are at 141 percent we're doing comprehensive rezoning so there's going to be will likely be changes at all okay thank you hi i'm Fang. i come here the third time and we just come back from dallas yesterday to join the middle school world robotic competition and the lincoln school my i have uh, my son is in the Lincoln School uh, Middle School Magnet Program, and uh, they have the three competitive robotic teams. And uh, first, I would like to tell everybody we need to acknowledge the education board to support the kids' activity. That's, uh, this is the last year the education board support us trip to the Dallas. And uh, in the back, you can see this is this year. <laughs> We went to the Dallas, and the Lincoln Middle School got the award, second place. That's great. And also the other team got the third place in, out of 800 teams in the world. So um, I come here, I would uh, not only acknowledge the, the education board support, but also uh, kind of talking about uh, preserve the magnet program in the, not only Lincoln Middle School, Bishop and also the other school. Uh, and also, um, so I, I, I already know the reason, and I think this is necessary to reason to balance the enrollment rates in the different area. Um, I think uh, consider the, cons Consider the transportation uh, and also the, the, the teacher's resource. If the teacher is willing to teach in, in the long distance school, and also the kids like my son have these robotic teams, and uh, they, they basically already have this team for two years. My son is in the seventh grade. So he, he is willing to continue his group uh, in this magnet program. So I would like to suggest to preserve the magnet program in the schools and add some new uh, magnet program or other, other some after school activity to kind of change the enrollment rate. That's my point. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I would like to show. This is the post. Hi, 
I'm a teacher and a parent uh, in Alachua County. I will not give my name to the corruption of this board. Um, but I have a, a ninth grader that goes to Beholds, and she, this is her first year in the magnet program at that school. Um, just wanted, what, what, if you're thinking of moving magnet programs or thinking of getting rid of them, what's gonna happen to the kids that are already in the program? Because I know when I signed all the magnet paperwork, et cetera, there was no mention of the possibility that the magnet program could be, you know, just, uh, just not happening. So, you know, my daughter was supposed to be, she, she has high performing grades, et cetera. I remember when I did the magnet program at, when she was a middle schooler, she didn't, she wasn't able to be in her home uh, school at Oakview, the magnet program. Um, and I just, because she wasn't selected and I heard of never a reasons um, and that's fine. Um, but I think we're here, we're, we're at the magnet program at Beholtz, you know, she enjoys it. There's a strong history of the magnet program. There's a there's the store that they have there that's accredited with the Florida Credit Union. How how are you going to change, How if you're gonna move that program, how is that gonna work? Or you're just trying to get rid of the program? Um, I, I don't know, I have so many questions. I've only heard, you know, a little bit of magnet. I haven't heard the, the whys, the hows, uh, is it just Beholtz? I know there's a teacher shortage. Have you considered the two uh, people, the two teachers at Beholtz that have been in this program for many, many, many years? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just very frustrated to hear. I get the rezoning. I get that the, you know schools are under-enrolled, et cetera. But I just, I don't know. I'm very disappointed to hear that the potential that once again, you know, my daughter is going to be moved or or whatever the words are. Like what? Who, if the kids are already in a magnet program right now, how are you going to honor that? Because that's what I'm curious. Is that, is that something that you're going to do? I, I don't know. But that's why I'm here mostly. Well, as a teacher, because I feel really sorry for the potential of you know, teachers who have that passion, because there is a huge shortage. And so to me, you're just opening the door that, okay, another two teachers that have been in this, his, you know, this program for so, so many years. So I don't know. I'd like you to consider teachers. I'd like you to consider kids that are already in this program. I mean, this is her. Four, this will be three years after this year she has left. So are we just supposed to move somewhere else? I don't know. <laughs> and I just really feel sorry for those teachers. If you are potentially getting rid of the program or moving them, I don't even know how you're going to move them. You know, she's been able to go to competitions this year. She's, you know, it, there's just so many factors, so many, so many positive outcomes of that program and any magnet program. So yeah, I'm not giving my name because it's so corrupted, but thank you. So um, thank you, ma'am. Um, I will just say, I think you, you, you didn't watch a previous thing, but we yeah. have said that, I'm not sure where the rumor came from that we were discontinuing magnets or anything of that nature. Um, we have discussed, we had a workshop where information on existing magnet programs, location, enrollment, and things of that nature was shared because we have three new board members. Um, there was a talk of adding additional programs. There was no talk of, of getting rid of Buho. So I'm very well aware, um, I was seen a, an email that was sent out by um, one of the instructors with things that were not true. So. There's that. So we're, we, there, this board has not said that we're getting rid of magnets. So thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Um, good evening. My, my name is Ted DeBracke. Uh, I sympathize with all the problems you have because I've sat in a seat similar to yours in Pennsylvania more than 30 years ago. I was elected to a school board there when uh, there was a lot of controversy about building a new high school. We only had 8,000 students in the district. And, but we had 30 portables, and every single school was overcrowded and also needed to work. Uh, now, I thought I was going to be working on that, but during my first budget year, the superintendent comes in and proposes a 27% tax increase, and we were allowed to do that. Uh, we did knock it down to 19% that year. Second year, I was budget chairman, 10% that year. And I won't get into the reasons for that. Um, I want to talk, mention about three things before I get into the elementary school. One is I've read your policy about redistricting 
and, and or rezoning and stuff. Um, one of the, the last paragraph, I think, mentions that when you're working with the city councils and county council or commissioners, you're allowed to uh, say where a new development's kids will go to school. I mean, maybe you should actually enforce that either on your own or give them the feedback that it, there might be things that people won't really like. Um, another, uh, t the, my next two are actually on finances, uh, an impact fee for new development. I mean, maybe that's not going to change things too much as far as what the growth is, but at least it's money that you have. Uh, and another one is I heard on a recent board meeting about uh, busing uh, students with hazardous routes to school that you could get some funding for that from the state if you only asked for it. It's uh, being left on the table now. Now, now on elementary schools, and I, my numbers are based on 100% occupancy. Meadowbrook is 300 short, Newbury is 200 short, and six other schools are another 500 short. But the, the new Terwilliger has 300 seats available. Well, that's an instant fix right now there, and it's probably what you're going to do with the spot zoning or something very similar to it. But the real point I want to get to is, based on my question before about the old Terwilliger, well, that's, that facility is like in the perfect location to do a lot of things as far as reducing bus routes, uh, getting kids to go to school in their own neighborhood. Well, if you can eventually, with the... Uh, the rolling uh, thing that you're doing with moving kids around from one school to another while their old school is being fixed. Well, it almost sounds like you're all set up for that. You've moved the Tewilliker, old Tewilliker kids to the new, get, fix their old school, move them back, and then empty out the new Tewilliker for everybody else. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bra Brakey, right? No, Brakey. Brakey, yep, thank thanks. you. Thanks. Good evening, my name's Hani. Um, I was there um, two, two meetings ago. Uh, great to meet you guys all again. And uh, I actually really want to come here to appreciate all the hard work you guys have been putting for the um, school district. I know it's really hard to manage such a um, big thing. So, um, but also I would really urge that you guys put more thought onto the rezoning. And I would really appreciate, don't put the carriage in front of the horses. Make sure everyone, all the schools has the resource, as I mentioned last time. But also, I would love to um, see more work done um, on the real need. For example, uh, providing more programs for people who really have the gifts. For example, the sportings in the Eastside school side, in the Eastside side schools, or more maybe reading clubs for them, and even the um, West Side. I think uh, other school. A lot of uh, reading scores are, have been descending lately. So that's some effort we need to do. For example, fix the bathroom in Lincoln. That's something really small, but really helpful for the kids. And also, please pay attention to the educators. We have lost a lot of good teachers. And in this way, I think we qualified, if we want to provide the uh, really the quality education, Please pay attention to the needs of educators, administrators, and all those stuff. There are many work that I understand that you guys want to come here and really helping the school district, but there are a lot of work that will not be seen by, maybe people will not say, will not see, okay, you guys done so much, but the, actually those are the work that you really need to focus on. We don't, not, don't break things are already, already working, especially, for example, I know now you clarified that you will not take away the magnet programs. But there are, why there are rumors like that? Right now you're saying these rumors, but we have been hearing that, oh, you guys have concerns to go in school, all this stuff. Please don't break it. And instead, we know it's working. And it really earned, um, no matter the, how people recognize our school, right? Our um, school district, how, quali how qualified people we are and how good the kids performed. But also make sure this is gonna be a good example for the other school that don't have it. Please help them. Even if it's not magnet, but maybe for example, some kind of uh, gifted program, anything. So I think for the school result, let's not rush it. I know it's a good, 
Eventually, it will happen. But when you rush it and want to provide to the public in such a short time, I don't know how you can define the successful, how, how successful it is. Please do something that really need attention for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Nee. Anyone else? We welcome you to come before we... All right, thank you all for your input again. We have recorded this meeting and it will be available on our rezoning website. Again, we have another meeting coming up on the 10th at Santa Fe High School, also at 530. So if you're interested, we certainly would welcome you to come there. If you have some input uh, on the input form, if you would please leave it at the table out there and we'll get that information put together and shared with our board and our staff. One other thing I would like to ask you, which is not really rezoning related, but it is something we are asking all of our parents to do. We have our family survey that we do annually. It is absolutely critical that we hear from families uh, your thoughts about your school, school at home communications, what's being taught, the school environment, all of that information is absolutely critical so that our school administrators and our district administrators can make the kind of decisions that will create a strong learning experience for all of our students. So if you have not yet filled out that survey, we have a flyer out on the table that will give you information, it takes only about 15 minutes. All of your responses, your identities remain completely anonymous. It is a third party that's actually doing that survey, but we would appreciate it very much if you could fill that out. That is due by May 12th. I want to thank everyone for coming and hope you have a good evening.